Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Jack. And it's a real honour to be here and to be working in partnership with Esri. Uh, our institute was also started by a visionary, Steve Killalay, and he knew that in order to change the way the world thought about peace, and indeed to think about peace more often, we needed to think about progress, which meant tracking it in every country over time, measuring it and mapping it, and also costing it. Now, we do this uh, through a range of data-driven projects, uh, some of which uh, are done with Esri. We're not yet as big as Esri, but we need to be, and hopefully with Esri's help, we will get there, because violence containment costs the world $13.6 trillion every year, and it takes way too many lives. And part of the solution is data mapping, and even very simple data maps can save lives, and that's what I want to brief briefly touch on uh, in the next few minutes before throwing over some more sophisticated stuff from Josh and Tom. Now, I want to throw back to a very simple one uh, that changed many lives. This is 1854 in London. Cholera outbreaks were frequent. And people assumed that it was an airborne disease and there was nothing to prevent it. The only thing you could do when there was an outbreak was to run. Two people, though, in Soho had a different approach. It was the local doctor, John Snow, and the local parish priest and they produced a data map. And from that, even though they couldn't find out where the bacteria was in the, in the cholera, they were able to work out that it was a problem with the Broad Street pump. The solution, they removed the, the handle from the pump. That ended the outbreak, and that was the beginning of modern epidemiology and changed the course of public health. Now, sadly, peace and global violence did not take the same course. And this became patently obvious in the year 2000 when all the world's leaders got together to make eight commitments. Now, in that, at the Global Summit, they talked a lot about peace, and they wrote a lot about peace, but they didn't think they could track it, they didn't think they could make commitments to it, so they left it out. But they did make commitments, say, on disease and, and health. And since then, for instance, we have seen child mortality halved. That is, six, six million extra children are alive each year ever since that time and yet there has been very little progress on peace and violence. So Steve Killalay founded the Institute for um, Economics and Peace to help change this. And we go through a huge range of, of data sets and indicators and put it together, and that still wouldn't really change the conversation if it wasn't for simple things like these maps we produce with the Global Peace Index, our first product. This enables conversations to happen at all levels, including, in, this is in thousands of schools, in thousands of university courses. It gets picked up by journalists in ways that we hadn't seen before. Every time we release the Global Peace Index, it gets media reach of over a billion people, in large part because we can simplify it through mapping. And it gets people asking, how are we keeping up with our neighbours? Why are they doing better? What can we learn from them? And this happens not just nation to nation, but state to state, community to community. And we have governors saying to us, we want to change our, our peace score, we want to improve, we want to learn from others. And that changing the conversation meant that last time that there was a meeting of global leaders to set peace goals, which was in September last year, peace was now one of them. So for the first time in history, we have a global peace goal. It has 12 targets, 23 indicators. It is extremely exciting. This means that now every country is making a commitment to significantly reduce all levels and all <coughs> forms of violence and across 12 indicators. Now, the data for many of the indicators is better than for this one particular of the 23 uh, indicators. So there is hope, and together with people such as your good selves, with our partnership with Esri, we can help get mapping into people's hands from the nation level to look at how they're progressing and to meet their commitments and find solutions, right down to the community level, so that people, the, the local parish priests and uh, John Snows, the local doctors, can ensure that they are doing their bit. And it's often simple solutions that can significantly reduce violence. It might be improve the lighting in the local park. It is not always the, the big, uh, high-cost, high-tech solutions that are necessary. But they are also important, so um, I will invite you to have a look um, 
at our uh, data-driven products to join with us in trying to ensure that the world can achieve the global peace goal and save many more millions of lives through both simple mapping in everyone's hands down to the more sophisticated sort of products that I'll now throw over to Tom and Josh to talk about. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you, Alistair. So as Alistair stated, at the Institute for Economics and Peace, we're interested in tracking, recording and mapping all the various issues related to peace and conflict. And we're also interested in understanding what drives those issues. And there's perhaps been no more prominent issue related to peace and conflict in the 21st century than terrorism. There have been over 60,000 recorded instances of terrorism since the turn of the century. And over 30,000 people were killed in 2014 alone from terrorist attacks. So if we want to understand terrorism, there are a few things we need to know. We need to know where it's happening, we need to know how it's happening, who's responsible, we need to know if it's increasing or decreasing over time, and we need to know what's driving it. So faced with that analytical challenge and with the benefit of Tom's expertise as someone who works very closely with this data, we set out to use insights for ArcGIS, which Jack alluded to earlier, to help answer those questions. So what we're looking at here on the map is the raw data from something called the Global Terrorism Database, which is collected and maintained by an organization called START, based out of the University of Maryland. Every single point on that map represents a terrorist attack which caused at least one fatality over the period 2010 to 2015. And as we can see, there are over 25,000 such attacks over that time period. And that map, as we see it there, really doesn't help us get any clarity on the issue. It just tells us there's a lot of points. So let's flip the map to a view that helps us understand the concentration or density of those incidents. So by turning that point data into a heat map, we can condense down those 25,000 incidents and see where the terrorist uh, hotspots around the world are. So we can clearly see that there's one in, uh, related to uh, terrorist activity in Iraq and Syria, also in Afghanistan, and then to a lesser extent in Nigeria. So at this uh, kind of high level stage of doing summary analysis, it's very important that uh, the map is a very important tool. But we also want to take advantage of the other visualization techniques in Insights. So on the bottom left, we have a bar chart that summarizes uh, death, uh, sorry, fatalities from terrorism over that time period by region. And on the right, we also have a summary of fatalities from terrorism, but it's a tree map according to those organizations which were responsible. And what's interesting about what we've done here in Insights is that all of these elements are connected. So if I were to click on, for example, a region in this bar chart, you'll notice both the map and the tree map of the responsible organizations are updated accordingly. This lets us narrow our focus in a very interactive way and in a way that doesn't cost us anything. We can just experiment. So looking at that bar chart, we can see that terrorism is concentrated in a handful of regions with most of the fatalities occurring in the Middle East and North Africa, South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And looking at the tree map, we can see that there are a handful of terrorist organizations responsible for most of the fatalities from terrorism. But often we want to look at the data using more than one factor at a time. So for instance, when we look at terrorism by region, we also want to look at the attack types that occurred because the attack types tell us something about the tactics involved in terrorism in that region. So we can also look at the data not just by region, but also incorporating those fatalities which came from bombings and those fatalities which came from armed assaults. Those which came from bombings tend to occur from attacks which require greater planning and coordination, whereas those that occur as a result of armed assaults tend to be as a result of more opportunis opportunistic attacks or attacks taking place in the context of an ongoing civil war. So we can see that in the Middle East and North Africa, there are far more bombings than armed assaults, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, the reverse holds true. So when we look at this tree map of the organizations responsible for some of these terror attacks, uh, we've narrowed it down to a, a, a meaningful subset, which lets us make sense of the data. And filtering is a really important part of this kind of analysis. As you saw with the map uh, that had so many points, you really couldn't understand what, what was going on. The same is true of this element. And I can illustrate that by just turning off this filter temporarily, and suddenly all the clarity is lost. With insights, again, in a very interactive fashion, I can just undo that and get back to where I was. So again, encouraging experimentation. Now, these three cards that are linked together have told us quite a bit about the, the nature of terrorism at a high level. But one thing that they can't tell us so far is whether terrorism is increasing or decreasing over time. So we can take a look at that temporal aspect of the data because we have a date field in this data. So I'm going to select date and the number of fatalities and just drag them onto the canvas and create a chart. 
and insights are smart enough to figure out that this is temporal data and create a time series. And so looking at that time series, when we look at the, the sum of fatalities from terrorism over that five-year period, we can see that there has been a considerable increase over that time, although there, has been, there was a noticeable drop-off in the last six months of 2015, which occurred as a result of increased pressure placed on Boko Haram in the, in the northeast of Nigeria, and also a concerted effort to uh, stem activities, ISIL activities in Iraq. And just one final perspective on this connection between the cards, but now we have all the elements in place. If I click on this organization, ISIL or ISIS, you can see the map shows us the area of operations for that organization. The bar chart shows us the types of attacks that they're responsible for. And interestingly, the time series now shows that as an organization, they're a fairly recent phenomenon, only operating within the last three to four years. So the next step in our analysis is to take these, this general point data, and we want to produce some kind of summary measure, some kind of composite statistic which lets us compare terrorism between countries. We want to know if, there's, if the impact of terrorism has been greater in Iraq than Afghanistan or so on. And that's how we developed the Global Terrorism Index, which uses a weighted sum over a five-year period of all the deaths from terrorism, all the incidents, the injuries, and the property damage to produce a single composite score for each country. And that's what you're seeing on the map now, that GTI or terrorism index expressed as a thematic map where the darker areas indicate countries with a higher rank in that terror index. So once we have that composite measure for each country, we can then correlate it against other data sets at the national level to help us understand something more about the drivers of terrorism. Because one of the interesting things about terrorism is that the usual factors which correlate with other measures of violence like battle, death and war is, is that they don't correlate with terrorism. But one thing that does is group grievances, and that's what we're looking at at the scatter plot here. So on the x-axis, we have the Global Terrorism Index, and on the y-axis, we have a, measure, a composite measure of group grievances, which takes things like ethnic tensions and religious tensions into account in a country. So just from looking at that scatter plot, we can see that there's a generally strong relationship between group grievances and terrorism. But we want to drill down a bit, and we want to see if that relationship holds for different subsets of countries. So one way we can do that is to color the points on the scatter plot according to whether a country is a member of the OECD or not. The OECD is an organization that brings together highly economically developed countries to promote cooperation, trade, development, and economic growth. So you can see on the map there, in a second, whether countries are, mem whether countries are members of the OECD or not. So if we look at the scatter plot, we can see that those countries in orange, uh, kind of clustered at the bottom left of the scatter plot, are members of the OECD and those countries in blue are not. And suddenly that reveals something more about the relationship between group grievances and terrorism. So there we go. So the countries in orange are OECD members, countries in blue are not. So we can see that for those countries that are members of the OECD, the relationship between group grievances and terrorism is a lot weaker. Whereas for those countries that are not OECD members, the relationship is in fact stronger, which tells us that perhaps there's a mitigating effect of economic development on terrorism, meaning that group grievances uh, aren't, aren't as responsible for leading to terrorism in countries with higher levels of economic development. So at this stage, we've, we've focused only on looking at terrorism at the global level and looking at levels of terrorism between countries. So the next step in our, next step in our analysis is we want to zoom in on one country in particular. So in the next tab, we're going to be looking at terrorist activity in Afghanistan. So the map that you see on the left has a, a point for every single uh, fatality from terrorism in Afghanistan over the period 2000 to 2015. And then if we look at the map on the right, we have a map of the 323 administrative districts in Afghanistan. So if we restrict our analysis just to the map on the left, it's very difficult from looking at that to say what are the differing levels of uh, fatalities from terrorism in Afghanistan by district. So we want a way to visualize that data in a way that makes it clear which, which districts are suffering more from the impact of terrorism. And I guess the map Tom's looking to create is one which would be similar to the GTI map we showed where it's thematically expressed with the higher counts of terror in a particular district being a darker color. Um, now, as a GIS person, I know that what he needs to do is a spatial aggregation, but as an analyst and a researcher, he may not realize that that's the tool he needs to use. So, in fact, it's easier in insights than having to understand that. I can just take those points of incidence across the country, drag them over my map of the districts, and just drop it on spatial aggregation. I can choose fatalities as the thing I want to count, and then just run the tool. And then with a little bit of uh, rework, just to simply change the way the map is expressed, 
I've got the map that he was looking for, which helps me understand the, the areas of uh, intense activity within Afghanistan. Now, behind the scenes, new data was created when I performed that spatial analysis. And if, if you had eagle eyes, you might have seen that going on up here to create this new temporary data set. And this is a key part of what's going on with insights. It's as you build your analysis, it's keeping everything you do. And if you really wanted to, you could get into the raw data and work with it, keep it, share it, persist it, whatever you need to do. So it's all there for you if you need it. And I think it's important to realize that this concept of steps and workflow is really key to how you use this tool. And it becomes really evident when you think about what would happen when you'd done this, what you'd want to do with it. And behind the scenes, if we look at what Insights has created for each of these tabs, we see what we call a workflow. It's the steps we took and the outcomes we created that allow us to create this analysis. And you can see for each of them some familiar things that you saw on the screen. And why is this important? Well, it means that Tom, as an analyst, can share his tradecraft, if you like, his analysis with another person with his skills. They can hydrate it with their data and repeat the experiment. But this sharing goes further. Not only the workflow, but his audience would probably be more interested in simply the outcome. So the, the workbook as a whole, each tab that we looked at, or individual elements like the charts and the maps and the tables can be shared discreetly to just deliver the message that a particular audience needs. So to summarize, at the start of the demonstration, we set ourselves the task of finding out a little bit about terrorism, about uh, where it occurs, how it occurs, who's responsible, whether it's been increasing or de decreasing, and what's driving it. So we hope that we've shown in this, in this short time a, little bit, a few answers to those questions. So we can see the hotspots of terrorism around the globe, where it's clustered in Syria and Iraq, and then also in Afghanistan and Nigeria. We've seen that there are a handful of terrorist groups which are responsible for the majority of fatalities from terrorism, even though there are thousands of terrorist groups recorded in the database. We can see that terrorism has been increasing over the last five years, albeit with a prominent drop-off in the last six months of 2015. And then we can also see that terrorism is closely related to group grievances within a country, although that's somewhat mitigated by economic development. So we can take that analysis and then use it as a basis for more uh, sophisticated and in-depth analysis in future iterations of the Global Terrorism Index. Thank you. Thank you.